In this video, we will analyze John 3.16 in context, along with the nuances of language and even the mathematics that John employs in this gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. In the history of missions and evangelism, no verse has catalyzed more conversions to the Christian faith than John 3.16. In the history of Christian teachers and preachers trying to succinctly summarize the gospel of salvation, there has not been a verse that compares with John 3.16 in terms of its clarity and success. John 3.16 has been translated into more languages, and pamphlets, and books than any other statement in the history of humankind. And John 3.16 has been the launching pad for more sermons on salvation than any other verse in the Bible. And the strange thing is, it was so overused that it started to lose its power, that it began to sound kind of cliche. When I became a Christian in 2006, I went to a church that was very old school, had a lot of older people, had some young people, but it was mostly old people. It was a King James only church. It was very fundamentalist. People said thee and thou, and they used the old English, not just when they read the Bible, but even when they spoke to each other. Or when they were preaching sermons. I mean, it was really, really old school. And they were always talking about salvation. And you heard this verse so much that it became kind of trite, that it lost its power. It, it no longer had much of an effect. And I remember thinking to myself, when I pitch salvation to non-Christians, I'm not going to use this verse because it's just been used and abused uh, to the point that it's no longer recognizable. Interestingly enough, this is no longer the case. If you recite this verse in the ears of a 20-something-year-old or a 30-something-year-old, chances are they haven't heard it. And as sad as that might sound, that's actually kind of a good thing because uh, this verse is not trite to them. It still resonates with their ears. It very succinctly summarizes the gospel, uh, something that people sometimes struggle to communicate or struggle to understand. John 3.16 is become extremely helpful once again. It remains a very powerful verse for the sake of witnessing. Now, on the level of translation, there are only a couple words here that are much debated. One of them is the Greek word utos, the first word in the verse. It can be translated as we have it here to indicate the degree of God's love. For God so loved the world, that is, that he loved the world this much, that he gave his only son. It can also be translated not to state the degree of God's love for us, but rather the manner or way in which God loved the world. For this is how God loved the world. This is the means. This is the method. That he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, this debate here, I think, is not the most important in the world, because whether we say it's the degree he loved the world so much, or whether we say it's the manner that he loved the world in this particular way, uh, these two ideas are not exclusive of one another. For example, if we go with this second translation, this is how God loved the world, and the focus is on the method. Well, uh, within this method, God giving up his son, it still communicates to us the high degree in which he loves us, that he still loves us so much. And in fact, there are some grammarians who will tell you that utos in this verse is meant to carry both meanings. So I don't think it's that big of a deal if your English translation goes one way or the other on this. I think, in fact, uh, to some measure or another, that both senses are implied in the meaning. Who is speaking here? Who utters the words of John 3.16? Is it Jesus or is it John the author? Throughout chapter 3 to this point, 
we have been following a dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus. Is Jesus saying the words of John 3.16 to Nicodemus within the story, within that dialogue? Or has the author left the dialogue in order to say something to his audience? And so we're not supposed to imagine Jesus as saying the words of John 3.16. This is something the author is telling to the readers of this book. And the dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus has terminated in verse 15. Most scholars understand this to be the author John against the King James Version, especially if you got one of those red letter versions of the old King James Bible. You'll see that John 3.16 is in red, indicating that Jesus utters these words in his conversation with Nicodemus. However, most scholars, as I said a moment ago, they think that Jesus and Nicodemus dialogue terminated in verse 15. And so now the author is speaking to his audience, but Jesus is not uttering these words. So who's talking here? Is it, is it Jesus or is it the author John? Now, most likely it is not Jesus. Most likely it is the author John, and there are a number of reasons for this. John 3.16 switches to the past tense, as where the stuff before it has been mostly in the present tense. This switching over to the past tense likely indicates the position of the author in time. He is writing at a time when Jesus has already been crucified, raised from the dead, and ascended up into heaven. And so he's looking back. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So he, he's looking backwards. Now Jesus, in the conversation with Nicodemus, it's not likely that he would say it this way. He would use the future tense. God is going to give his only son up to death. Uh, because within the context of the dialogue with Nicodemus, Jesus has not yet died. Switching to past tense here for this verse and the following verses likely indicates that we have left the dialogue of Jesus and Nicodemus. It terminated at verse 15. Now the author is speaking to his audience. There are also some reasons to believe this on the level of vocabulary. The phrase one and only, as in the one and only son, uh, monogenes, is a word used exclusively by the author elsewhere in John's writings, and it's never used by Jesus. Also, the phrase believe in the name and live by the truth otherwise never occur in speeches of Jesus. Uh, but those terms and phraseology are coming up in this dialogue. So it's just a minor point, but you can see even in film depictions that Jesus is sometimes depicted as uttering the words of John 3.16. Most likely that's not the case. Most likely the story with Jesus and Nicodemus is over in verse 15, and this is John stepping away from that and writing in his own material to say something to the Christian audience that is going to be reading the fourth gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This may not seem like a very revolutionary statement to you because you have heard it, because Christianity has been a thing for your entire life. But in the first century world, this was completely revolutionary. Remember, when we say that God so loved the world, we're not talking about the earth, right? We're talking about the realm of God's enemies, the, the, the social world, that is, the cultures and the systems and the ways of life that turn people into the enemies of God. God loves that world. He loves those people so much that he gave up his only son. Traditional Platonism, Platonism being a very popular philosophical worldview at the time of the New Testament, associated love with desire, hence would not associate it with deity. They would have said that love is beneath a God, because if, if God loves something or desires something, then that means he is incomplete, and he is looking to things outside himself to complete himself. And so they would have said, no, a God cannot love. That is absurd, that is ridiculous. And yet in the face of Platonism, Christianity maintains not only that God loves, but even that he loves his enemies. Most Greek religion was based more on barter and obligation than on a personal concern of deities for human welfare. Uh, Homer's epic tradition had long provided pictures of mortals that were especially loved by various gods, but these were particular individuals and not humanity as a whole, uh, and certainly not God's enemies. 
that sometimes you would get these love affairs between a particular goddess and a particular mortal, and you know they would end up having offspring like Hercules or something like that. But you don't get that a god would love all of humankind. Certainly not. Far from it, actually. The gods typically regard humankind as being a nuisance or even as being a mistake. Uh, nothing like this in the world of Greek religion. Now, there were a few deities, especially the motherly uh, Demeter and Isis, who are betrayed as loving deities toward their clients. But again, uh, this is their clients, those who worship them, those who serve them, those who bring gifts to the altar. Uh, it's not sacrificial love for the benefit of one's enemies. We talked about God's love within the context of pagan religion, but what about within the context of Judaism? Judaism rarely or never spoke of God's loving the world outside of Israel. It is a uniquely Christian idea to say that God's love extends beyond the limits of race and nation. Popular Jewish writings at the time of the New Testament, uh, such as Jubilees or even sectarian writings, such as those at the Dead Sea Scrolls, reveal an ensconced hatred against other races of people. God loves the Jewish people. He may not love all of them. It depends on which Jews you ask. If you talk to the ones who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, he pretty much only loves them. He doesn't love other Jews, but he certainly, certainly does not love the Gentile nations, the Gentile races of people. And here we have Christians, and a Jew wrote this, and as we discussed in previous videos, he is most likely writing for a Jewish Christian audience in Asia Minor that still goes to synagogue or at least has been thrown out of synagogue or is in the process of being thrown out of synagogue due to their Christian faith. And uh, here they are, these Jews, Jews like John, saying, no, not only does God love Gentiles, he even loves the Gentiles before they are worshipers, even while they're his enemies. God makes the first move and reaches out his hand uh, in order to bring them into a loving and saving covenant. Uh, this is just radical. There is nothing like this in the world of ancient religion. And it says we must respond to this with belief, with faith. I like what Martin and Wright say. Faith is yielding to the action of the spirit who first moves a person to assent to what God has revealed and to commit one's whole life to God. This is an important statement because when it says that you must believe, in the context of John's gospel, this doesn't just mean, well, I believe in Jesus, now I'm going to go do what I want. That type of faith cannot save you. The only type of faith that can save you is the type of faith that transforms you. And the following verses are going to make that clear. I had an undergraduate professor who liked to tell us that John 3.16 was not really there, that this was an artificial construct. He wasn't always very clear with his meanings, but what I think he was referring to was versification, that the Bible was not always divided up into chapters and verses, and that starting John 3.16 with the word for and ending it with the word life, that this is an arbitrary construct that has been imposed upon the text. And this is factually correct as far as it goes. You don't get chapter divisions in the Bible until the year 1227, uh, Rabbi Nathan divides up the Old Testament into verses in the year 1448, and then one of the Protestant reformers, Robert Eschen, or otherwise known as Stephanus, in the year 1555, divides the New Testament up into verses for the Geneva Bible. So verses in the Bible are less than 500 years old. And so he's right as far as it goes, that there is no such thing as John 3.16 in terms of, uh, you know, a delineated unit of text. However, this raises the question, if we were to talk to the author of this gospel and we were to say, John, are you surprised at the impact John 3.16 has had in the history of Christianity? Did you intend for this to be a high point in your document? Uh, it, was this really the summary statement to you that it has become in the church, would he be surprised? Is there any evidence in his document that he really wants us to pay attention to John 3.16, that he considers this to be a very special and standout statement in the context of his document?
Well, in fact, there is. Here in a few months, I'm going to put a presentation on YouTube about the use of numbers and mathematics in the Gospel of John. But since we're at John 3.16, I would like to take just a little snippet out of that presentation and go ahead and go through it right now so that you can see that John uses numbers and mathematics to point to John 3.16 to let us know how important of a summary statement of the gospel this really is. So the prologue, John chapter 1, the first 18 verses, introduced us to the primary themes and ideas of John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and it carries on for 18 more verses. Well, as it turns out, that this prologue is exactly 496 syllables, a triangular number, if you went through my presentations on Revelation, you know that triangular numbers can be important in the Bible. I'll talk more about triangular numbers when I put that presentation out here in a few months. But 496 is a special number. It's a triangular number. And there are 496 syllables in the prologue. The epilogue, the final chapter of John's Gospel, where Jesus defines clearly the mission of the church when he has us draw in 153 fish. Again, I will talk about the 153 fish in a future lesson. But this chapter is also very important because it takes two of our primary characters and defines their role in church history. Peter's role is that of the chief under shepherd. When Jesus in the epilogue takes Peter aside and he says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And John's primary role is witness. This notion that uh, you know, Jesus says, if I want him to remain until I come again, what is this to you? He's, he doesn't mean that John is not going to ever die. He means that John's voice of witness, uh, as it's been presented to us here in the fourth gospel, that this document is to remain as a primary witness for the life of Jesus until he comes again. Now, it's interesting because this epilogue consists of 496 words. So the prologue, exactly 496 syllables, and then the epilogue, exactly 496 words. Now this surely is not a coincidence. So if this triangular number, 496, is important enough to structure the prologue, and if it's important enough to structure the epilogue, what does it point to within the main body of the text? What does it point to in the story about Jesus. Well, there is one word that using gematria does in fact reveal a value of 496. And remember that in ancient languages like Hebrew or Greek, the letters were also numbers. So if we take this word monogenes, which means uh, one of a kind or special or unique, and we count up the value, we take its individual letters and their values. So the first letter is mu or m, and it has a value of 40. Second letter is Omicron, a value of 70. And we go on down the word, we find that this word has a total of 496. This number from the prologue and from the epilogue points here to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This word only here, one of a kind, unique, special. And we consistently see that this gospel is all about revealing the special one of a kind identity of Jesus. Uh, even in this context, he's told us that no one comes down from heaven, discloses a message on earth, and then goes back into heaven except for the son of man. There are all these special characteristics of Jesus, these special functions. He is high priest. He is sacrifice. He is God made flesh. He is so many different things in this gospel. He is unique. He is special in God's economy of things. And by making the numbers and the math, by making the prologue and the epilogue and their numerical structure point to John 3, 16, we can see the author is saying, Look at this here, this statement, this is special. This is what I want you to understand. This is the statement that encapsulates everything else that is said in this gospel. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. In the first video, I shared how this gospel does not always obey the rules of time, that oftentimes Jesus will discuss things that have happened long ago, like the creation of the world, as though they're still ongoing. And sometimes there are these emanations from the future, things that Jews would have understood to be at the end of history, such as the Great Judgment. Jesus will talk as though these things are already taking place. The final judgment is actualized in Jesus' first coming, in the sense that the basis for condemnation is brought into history. Jesus has arrived, and Jesus will be the basis as to whether or not one is condemned or one is saved. Jesus will judge the world in the end, even if judgment is not the objective of his first coming. Now, I say this because chapter 3 here just said that Jesus did not come to judge the world. But in chapter 5, it seems to say something else. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. and He gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. So how do we uh, square these two passages? Well, if we read them both in context and compare them with each other, what they seem to be saying is that Jesus did not come to judge the world. His purpose was to save. However, when people reject that salvation, he takes up the role of judge by default. It is a secondary role. It comes primarily in, uh, just, just for the sake of salvation. But he only becomes judge after the salvation uh, is rejected. And so uh, that's how we need to understand this. He doesn't come because he wants to judge. He comes because he wants to save. He judges because he has to, because people will reject that salvation. N.T. Wright says the darkness and those who embrace it must be condemned not because it offends against some arbitrary laws which God made up for the fun of it, but because evil is destroying and defacing the present world and preventing people from coming forward into God's new world. We do not run away from sin because we're religious fools who picked up some old book and it talks about these things called sin and we're just going to stay away from sin because we don't know what it's like to have a good time and, and because uh, uh, you know, we're religious and uptight. God doesn't hate sin because he's a killjoy. He hates sin because it kills joy. These things that we call sins are bad in their own right. They hurt people. That's why we don't like sin. Not because uh, we're, you know, antithetical to having a good time, but because we want people to have a good time uh, in a sense that is lasting and good for them in the long term. When I became a Christian, this was one of the easiest things for me to accept as a Christian, that sin was a bad thing. Because as I read the Bible, and I found all these things that were described as sins, and then I looked at the lives around me, and I looked at my life, I could see how these sins had harmed everybody. Uh, you know, I'm, th I'm thinking of the marriages and the household I came from. I'm thinking about my relationship with my siblings, with my friends. Uh, those of us who failed at school, those of us who had legal problems, those of us who had addiction problems, uh, all the people who couldn't get along with their wives or their husband or their children. I mean, I can just see it everywhere. Uh, this makes sense. Christianity gave me a new lens in which to see the world, and it helped me to interpret things. It, it, Christianity seemed to interpret the world correctly. It seemed to interpret human experience correctly. And so, when we talk about sin leading to condemnation, look, these things that we call sin, they are real, they are objective, and they actually harm you. And in the day of judgment, some of us will have corrupted ourselves so fully that we cannot be redeemed. So it's not a weird religious thing. We hate sin because sin destroys life. And this is why God hates sin. It's, it's not that he's trying to slap us on the back of a hand with a ruler. It's that he loves us, and he's trying to guide us away from those things that harm us. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For anyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. When it says, and this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, it's not explaining the verdict. It's not saying that, that 
because people are found guilty, Jesus has come into the world and that this is the verdict, that this is the judgment being actualized. It's rather explaining the basis of the verdict, right? Why is the world going to be condemned? Well, it's because they rejected Jesus. As it turns out, this is not just a matter of beliefs and opinions, that the beliefs and opinions you hold about Jesus actually hold eternal consequences. Uh, we don't want to cave in to the postmodern notion that what a person thinks or believes doesn't matter. All that matters is whether or not you get along and get by in community. Not so. Your beliefs, your opinions about the person of Jesus are extremely important. And so we have 21 chapters here that are designed not so much to tell you how to live. There's not many lists of ethical do's and don'ts in John's Gospel. This book is all about getting your opinion right about Jesus because you will be held accountable for your opinion, your personal belief about Jesus in the age to come. People are not condemned because they failed to succumb to a belief in Jesus due to culture or lack of exposure to the gospel. This verse supposes that people fail to come to Jesus because they don't want their lifestyle corrected. We live in a culture that is based upon victimhood. Everyone who is victimized is a hero. And I'm not saying this to downplay those who have been uh, victims of, of, say, sexism or racism. Those are very real things, and I'm not going to pretend like they're not. Those things happen. Those things are real. And as Christians, we must care about justice. We cannot become conservative cynics who dismiss uh, uh, the concerns of minorities as though they're not true. These things really are happening. However, Sometimes the concern for social justice in our culture uh, creates an excuse-making attitude where if someone fails in anything, they don't have to take responsibility for it. Uh, we just talk about conditioning. We talk about the, the household I grew up in, the parents I had, the neighborhood I come from. All of these things become excuses. And as Osborne is pointing out, John will hear none of that. And it kind of resonates with some of my personal experiences. I've had friends who, even though they didn't come from a background that was conducive to Christianity, just as I didn't, uh, in the course of conversation and in the course of relationship, they can be brought to a point of conviction and interest in the things of God. And then you tell them that repentance is required, and right away they turn it off, and they're no longer interested in the conversation. I had one particular friend who was very successful with the ladies, and he was very much sexually active. And one night when we were together, he he told me that uh, he had an interest in the things of God and he wanted to go to church with me. Over the course of conversation, I explained that he'd have to repent. He said, what is repentance? And, and I said, well, it means that you're going to let some things go. And I went on to explain that sexual immorality, having sex with multiple partners, watching pornography, that all of these things have to go for the rest of your life. And he responded with aggression. He said, F that. And with that, the conversation was over. It's nothing to do with his cultural or predisposition. Even when we overcame all those things and he had an interest in God, he encountered the fact that there was some personal responsibility required as a Christian, and then he was done. That's what John is talking about here. You can't blame it on culture. You can't blame it on background. Even when those things are overcome, there are still people who don't want to follow Jesus because they know it will cost them something. And so they just do what they want. John is writing to let those people know they will be held accountable in the day of judgment for their failure to follow Jesus. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. For John, the central work yielding the new eternal life is faith. But once one is truly in the light, he will keep God's other commandments, especially loving one's fellow disciples. We don't want to do what many have done and say, I believe and therefore I am okay. Uh, all of these statements that of being saved by faith in this gospel and also in Paul's writings are immediately connected to good works. Because if you really believe this stuff, you will keep the commandments. There is no such thing as I believe and I am saved, and now I am not going to keep the commandments. John 
does not even consider that a possibility. That, that doesn't come remotely close to what he's trying to say. And for people to take snippets out of this document and say, well, I have believed and I have called on the Lord and, and I believe in my heart and therefore I'm going to be saved. And then to turn around and disregard the commandments, uh, John is making it clear with the things he's saying here in verses 20 and 21, that such people will not be saved even though they think they have believed because real faith, real belief has a components of allegiance that carries on for the rest of your life. This verse qualifies that one's works must be carried out in God, suggesting that if a work appears moral, yet it is not infused by faith, it is not salvific. You hear this a lot of times in the culture that uh, I may not believe in Jesus and I may not go to church and I may not do the things in the Bible, but I'm a pretty good guy, so I think I'm going to be okay. John is not interested in the moral quality of what you do in and of itself. He's only interested in moral qualities that have been produced in you as a result of faith in Christ. Right? We are not a religion of do-gooders where we, we praise and believe in the salvific value, the salvation value of every good deed just because it appears good to us. We are concerned with those good deeds which are produced in your life as a result of believing in Christ. John is not interested in other types of good deeds. He is only interested in the good deeds that flow from your faith in Jesus. He understands that faith in Christ will be transformative for you. And even if you were to do good deeds as an unbeliever, you're going to do more of these as a believer. Right? Each individual, uh, whoever you are as a non-Christian, uh, you will be improved as a Christian who, who receives the Holy Spirit. So we, we want to watch carefully here as he talks about good deeds. He doesn't mean any and every kind of good deed. He's only concerned with good deeds that come as a result of your faith in Christ. That's what he's talking about. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to Jesus and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one believes his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Jesus and the baptizer are baptizing concurrently. Now, just a quick little tidbit. There are those who say that the reason many of the stories in the synoptic gospels don't show up in John's gospel is because John either doesn't know about them or disagrees with them. But we can see here how he just says in passing before John was arrested. John's arrest is only recorded in the synoptics. Well, it's clear that the fourth gospel knows about him being arrested, but he never narrates it. There's no talk about uh, how Herod uh, has a woman dance for him, and then they take John and, and you know they cut his head off. He doesn't have to narrate these things because he assumes you already know them. The Synoptic Gospels are written in the 60s and the 70s. John's Gospel is likely written in the mid-90s of the first century. Oftentimes, John may leave out things that are in the Synoptic Gospels, not because he doesn't agree with them or because he doesn't know about them, but because by the time the fourth gospel is written, the other three have already been circulating for decades, and he doesn't need to record things that people already know. 
John permits Jesus and John's ministries to overlap. This extension may be to create a scene of apparent competition between the two that is deflated when John admits Jesus is superior. We've talked about how this gospel was written in part to bring the baptizer's followers into the church, that there are many who followed the baptizer who did not come to follow Jesus. And this gospel is written to sort of bring them in. Well, if that's the case, then this is done really well. John and the baptizer are baptizing at the same time. This doesn't occur in the synoptic gospels, but it occurs here. They're baptizing at the same time so that the baptizer's followers could be uh, uh, reading or listening to this gospel be read, and they say, oh, look, they're they're baptizing at the same time. They're equal. And then here in a few verses, baptizers are like, nope, we're, we're not equal. Jesus is greater than I am. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, who is with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness? Look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. We don't know what question they asked. It seems that if John wanted us to know, he would have told us. But it's interesting. Uh, the question likely centered on Jewish ceremonial washing, especially John's baptism versus Jesus' baptism, since John is asked about Jesus' baptism. So you've got the Pharisees. They have their own version of baptism, their own version of ceremonial cleansing. Then John starts his version, and now Jesus is over here baptizing, and they likely want to know the difference between John and Jesus' baptism at this point. Uh, that's just speculation, though. Again, the author doesn't tell us precisely what the question was. Jesus is conducting a baptism of repentance, no doubt like that of John, since his chapter 7 says, the Spirit, a feature of Christian baptism, has not yet been given. So uh, Christian baptism would come to be an identification with Christ's burial and resurrection. It wasn't just for Gentiles, or excuse me, it wasn't just for Jews, it was for Gentiles too. There was all this talk about the Spirit, a uh, big debate over uh, the Spirit's role in Christian baptism. I discussed that in a previous video. But none of these things were features of John's baptism. But it's likely at this point, early on, that John's baptism by water and the baptism by water that Jesus' disciples are doing, uh, it likely cannot be distinguished, likely the same at this point, but Christian baptism will take on new life after the death and resurrection of Jesus. The baptizer says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. John represents the best man, whose duty in Jewish weddings was to oversee the details. His was an important part, as he took care of all the practical needs and made everything ready for the festivities. He was in charge of getting the bride ready, overseeing the purification rites, and leading the procession that brought the bride to the groom's house for the ceremony. The purpose of the friend was to deflect attention to the groom and to lead all the preparatory events, then disappear when the groom arrives. John was overjoyed to have that role. It's interesting that John describes himself as the best man, because in only the last chapter, we saw the wedding at Cana, and we discerned that the true bridegroom at that wedding was Jesus, because it's the bridegroom's job to uh, provide the wine. And even though that wasn't actually Jesus' wedding in history, that wedding pointed to the heavenly wedding, where Jesus is the bridegroom who creates wine out of water. And so now we are returning back to that thing. That theme. Who is the best man in this heavenly wedding? Well, it, it is John. Now, there's an interesting part here. He says, the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. What does he mean when he talks about ancient weddings? He's making this analogy, and he says that the best man hears the voice of the bridegroom and rejoices greatly. Everyone is waiting at the bride's house for the bridegroom to come and lead his bride back to his own house, accompanied by her bridesmaids, family, and friends. Then the celebration can begin. The best man listens for the bridegroom's voice, which will tell him that the wedding rejoicing is about to begin and that his own task has been completed. Ancient weddings in Israel lasted for a week. That is a very long celebration. That's a lot of wine. That's a lot of drinking. That's a lot of food. You've probably had the same conversation 20 times by the end of the wedding, and you're just ready uh, to call the whole thing off. But that is precisely when 
the best man gets to take his time off. He's been working to prepare the wedding. That's been his responsibility. And according to Martin Wright, when he hears that the bridegroom's voice is coming, because the bridegroom is coming to take uh, his bride away, well, that's when he says, okay, my job is done. Everybody else can start celebrating, but I get to relax now because uh, I've done my part. Well, that would be a good analogy for uh, the role of the Baptist here. Most of his work is preparatory for Jesus. Once Jesus is on the scene, not much of a need for the baptizer. Now, this perspective, though, is much more interesting. In reference to the voice of the bridegroom and how the best man is so happy when he hears the voice of the bridegroom, this is at least entertaining. Witherington says it may refer to the custom of the best man standing guard outside the house while the groom, grow, groom goes in to share the wedding bed with his bride. The voice of the bridegroom then refers to the shout of joy when the groom has successfully had marital relations with his bride on the wedding day. So the idea is, uh, you know, as I just read, the groom goes in with his bride. He has sexual relations with her. The best man is standing right outside the door in earshot. And apparently he's waiting for the groom to holler out in joy that the, uh, the sexual act has been successful. And as soon as, you know, the best man hears this, ear to the wall, I'm sure. He's like, okay, excellent, great job. And then he goes about his business. And of course, all of this goes back to the Old Testament. Israel is Yahweh's bride. Remember a few of these verses, Isaiah. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. Or Hosea. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. Now, how come the language of Yahweh's relationship to Israel is being passed on to Jesus in the church? Well, it's because Jesus is true Yahweh and the church is true Israel. Sometimes people on YouTube get mad at me for saying that the church is the continuation of Israel's identity. They're like, oh, you're an anti-Semite. Do you think that God has rejected his people? He's not gonna reject his people. Well, I didn't say he rejected his people. I said that the church is the continuation of Israel. I didn't say that God cast off Israel and started something new. I'm saying that the church's Israel continued. And there are loads of reasons to say this. And, and here's one of them. The marriage between God and his bride Israel, that's been transferred to Christ and the church because the church is Israel. That's why we have 12 apostles. That's why so many of the uh, prophecies made about Israel are related to the church in the New Testament as being fulfilled, right? There's just no getting out of this. The church is Israel. He must increase, but I must decrease. As usual, no one can put it better than C.S. Lewis, we must play great parts without pride in small parts without shame. Now that first part might seem very clear, great parts without pride, but what about small parts without shame? I've thought of this recently while trying to get into PhD programs, that I don't want to apply to any of the middle of the road schools, I just want to apply to good schools. And why don't I want to apply to the schools that my professors went to? Well, yeah, it is good to uh, go to a reputable school. It might be good for your program, might be good for getting published later, it might put you in a position to do all sorts of good things for the kingdom. All of those things are true. I also want to believe big, that God can do big things that I don't deserve, that I certainly haven't earned. All those things are true and right and good. But there's also this element of pride. If I went to one of those middle of the road schools, I might feel ashamed. Now, why do I feel ashamed? Well, because my ego wanted something better. We might think that pride and shame are opposites, but the truth is they're just variations of the same thing. They both grow out of that unhealthy human tendency to be preoccupied with ourself, right? So, so Lewis is really putting it well here. We must play great parts without pride in small parts without shame. Pride and shame, they reflect the same fallen preoccupation with self. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. 
He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. In antiquity, wax seals gave authenticity and ownership to letters and uh, possessions also. Even illiterate people could recognize the official seals of important people in society. So to embrace Jesus is to set a seal or to confirm and to defend an entire constellation of beliefs that are central to the Christian faith. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Spirit loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. When it states that he gives the Spirit without measure, who's the he? Is God giving Jesus the Spirit without measure, or is Jesus giving his disciples the Spirit without measure? Both ideas have been defended and supported. John 20, verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. That is, Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So this would seem to suggest that Jesus is giving the Spirit to his disciples uh, without measure. Uh, Martin and Wright, as Jesus has received the Spirit entirely from the Father, he can pour out the Spirit upon others. And then there's the other's perspective. Some have speculated that the verse describes how the Son gives the Spirit to believers. It seems clear that these verses are about what God has given to Jesus, equipping him for his mission in the world. And I would agree with this just because in context, uh, this has all been about what Jesus gets from the Father and who he is. Uh, it hasn't so much been uh, about Jesus giving things to his disciples. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Notice that it's not just belief here, but belief is coupled with obedience. Obedience is extremely important. Jesus contrasts belief not only with unbelief, a different way of thinking, but also with disobedience, a different way of acting as well as thinking. Faith becomes a way of life when it is active in a life of prayer and obedience. Salvation, the process, the, the way to salvation. Salvation is not just something you did when you walked the aisle. You are working out your salvation with uh, prayer and trembling every day of your life as, as you are headed toward eternity. God's grace enables you to believe. That grace through faith enables you to obedience. And this life enables you to salvation, to triumph in the day of judgment.